Welcome to chapter 10 in our Getting Started with the Lyra series. In this chapter, we're going to start to bring together the open world server from Saber Dart Studios and our Lyra startup project together so that we can use the database aspects of OWS2 to basically persist our inventory items and other attributes between matches and, and sessions. And so the persistence layer of OWS2 is what we're going to be using in this video series. Um, I am not going to spend an entire video on setting that up. Dart has done some outstanding videos on that. I will try to put either links in the notes or, uh, or links in the video to, uh, to his tutorials. But we're going to pick it up with an assumption that you do know what um, the open world server series is. Uh, you may be following along with the hub world MMO. Um, and so we're going to be using both of those here in, in this video. So first, let's talk about our high level setup. Um, we did a uh, let's talk about video around the game client and the game servers. Um, I will link that here as well. But basically, in a standard Lyra setup, we have our game client, which is our PC. We are then um, basically connecting to a game server, which may be someone else's game client, um, or it may be a dedicated server. And we're using Epic Online Services for our uh, sessions to find the other sessions, uh, find the other servers via the session interfaces. Um, but everything we've done up to this point has been non-persistent. In other words, once the game was over, the match was finished, all the inventory was lost. And so in order to address that, we're going to be incorporating the OWS2 um, database server and instance manager. And so again, Dart's videos on those are outstanding. So we're not going to cover all the steps of the setup, but we will highlight a few elements here on how to set that up. So what I did is basically download and install both the Open World Server 2 and the Hub World MMO from Dart site. You can see the links here to each of those respective sites. Followed the steps on setting up my open world server so that I have a fully functioning open world server, set up my hub world MMO so that I could connect to the open world server from the hub world MMO. And so basically the first step is to get both of those platforms up and running. Uh, then simply create a second customer GUID uh, because both hub world MMO and the Lyra Startup Project can actually coexist in the same uh, OWS2 setup. So you don't need to have two copies of the open world server. You just need to have two customer GUIDs, one for Hub World and one for the Lyra project. Uh, I then copied the OWS plugin and instance launcher folders from Hub World into my Lyra project. Just made a copy of those two. And just a quick note as we start to go through this, in my particular setup, um, I have a second computer that is the open world server. So in my INI files, uh, I have the internal IP address for that server, as opposed to in the stock videos, you'll see local hosts being used, which assumes that the database server is running on your local uh, desktop. So I have two, therefore, when you see the configurations, you'll see the internal IP address. So basic flow was one, copy over the plugin. Now our design is gonna basically extract from the plugin those elements that we need. Um, and hopefully the plugin will no longer be required when we're done done. Um, but for now, we're just putting the plugin so we get all the uh, features. We went into our build CS file and added the JSON and the HTTP and the OWS plugin into the uh, dependencies so that we could compile our Lyra project. Uh, 
Then we regenerate with the right click, generate your Visual Studio projects on your Lyra project. Launch up your editor, check that the OWS plugin is enabled. Um, and at this point you should have the plugin at least accessible via your, uh, your Lyra starter project. So next you go into your OWS instance launcher into your uh, app settings JSON and basically paste in your new API key, uh, set your APIs, here's my internal setup, um, and then go into your uh, game, default game INI file, also set up your API key there. Uh, and one thing to note, because I am inside my private network, uh, rather than dealing with the HTTP, HTTPS, um, I've switched the pass to HTTP. Um, and when you do that, you just drop the port number by one. So your 303 becomes 302. So if you are mimicking a two server strategy and you're going to have, uh, you're just working inside your network, you're not bridging over the internet, then you can just do HTTP uh, and just change your port numbers uh, down by one number by one number on, on each of them, and that seems to work just fine. So now our instance uh, manager has its configuration set up. Um, it's pointing to the second customer uh, GUID key versus your Hub World MMO GUID key. And for a test, we'll just fire up the instance manager to check the connectivity, everything works, you should see a similar screen to this where it spins up uh, all the instance manager components and that it has the proper um, customer GUID and the proper um, IP, uh, HTML links. Okay. Next, we started to think about our design decision. So at this point, we've stood up the infrastructure. But we haven't really thought about how do we want to use the basic classes that are in the OWS2 plugin and our current design, right? So we can't just mush the two of them together. There are two different design styles and we're trying to keep our Lyra project uh, clean for upgradability. We're trying to move all of our stuff into uh, game features and therefore adding in classes in the actor hierarchy becomes problematic. Um, and so rather than that, we would prefer to be able to use um, all sort of component-based logic. So as we look at the, uh, the existing OWS plugin, um, there's really these five classes that are, are doing the, the bulk of the work up to this point of what we're trying to do, which is basically make a connection. Um, the player controller component, uh, which does all the heavy lifting. And in an ideal state, we would just add that component to our player controller and we'd be off and running. Um, if you look into the code of the player controller component, there's two or three references to the OWS player state or the OW, OWS uh, game instance. And so we would then have to incorporate those into our workflow in order to make the player controller component work as written. Um, so the heavy lifting is all done in that player controller. The user session GUID is stored in the player state. Uh, the registration and the login request is done in the widget, in the uh, OWS login widget. Uh, their game instance has some helper functions in it. Uh, encrypting and decrypting uh, and a few other uh, ancillary functions. And then the various structs that define the data payloads for the API structures are in the OWS character. So as we looked across those classes and we started to think about it, one other thing that we realized was if we're going to have a scenario where a client is in the lobby, and not attached to a game. In other words, I'm, I'm running in my own uh, non-connected state. 
that that logic we want to have in our game instance, since that basically assumes nothing, um, no match is running, no game is running, but I still want to be able to interact with the menu structure. For example, you want to register as a new user. You may want to be able to interact with a marketplace. Um, some of the things that you would do that are not necessarily in world, uh, we would route through our Lyra game instance. Now, because the game instance is a U object and not an actor, you can't use the game feature, or at least I'm unaware of a way, to use the game features to add a component to the game instance. You can add a component to an actor, but you can't add a component to the Lyra or to a game instance or basically a U object. So our choice was to make a child of the Lyra game instance so that we would retain all of the Lyra game instance logic, but then be able to code our own logic uh, in that child class. And so much of the code from the OWS login widget and much of the code from the OWS game instance ended up being refactored into the Lyra game instance plus um, for various reasons. We elected to go to the player state for our in-game interactions. And what, what we did was basically take all of the logic from the player controller component and factored that over. Uh, embedded the player state GUID ID into our player state component. And eventually we'll move the OWS character structs over. Um, but we're probably going to prune a bunch of the API interactions that we don't need for, for our design. Uh, so we're going to basically first finish our design and then we'll only carry forward the structs that we need for the various API calls that we're going to use. Um, so the those are the two basic classes. Um, much of the C++ was sort of lift and shift with a little bit of you know retrofitting and adjusting in order to make it work. Um, and that seems to be working at least through this stage. So that presents our first major design challenge, which is if we have the Lyra game instance uh, on the client and we want to use it for registering new users and we basically want to connect to the public API structure and do sort of non-game events through the Lyra menu. So browse the marketplace, buy a cosmetic, uh, change the look of your character. All of those things are not impacting the game dynamics. And so they can all be done through the public API. But we want to protect any of the in-game uh, interactions to be only on the server. And so our choice is to put the player state component only on the player state for players on the server so that we don't run into a scenario where we've got a player state in the client um, attempting to cheat, uh, unlock things, etc. So the player state component resides only on the server and therefore it can connect to the public API just like the client can. Uh, it will create its own uh, user session GUID, uh, but it has access to all the APIs. And so it can go to the character persistent APIs and it can do all the other uh, global data, etc. that only the server should have access to. So we have um, a choice to make. And in the interest of getting this video out, we took the first path, which was easier, which is two session IDs. We basically would prefer to only have one client session ID, but we need to figure out a clean way to take the session ID that is created on the client in the game instance and have it um, passed to the game state component. The easiest answer to that would be to place a variable on the player state um, and then 
read it from the component. However, that would require us to make a child of the Lyra player state, which we could do, and we probably will do. Um, but for now, the for this test, for this level, we're just going to do two session IDs. So we duplicated the create session logic um, and basically run it twice. We run it once for the client when we're in the menu structure. And then when we enter a match and we're connected, uh, we run it again inside the player state component so that the server can have its direct path to all the database data. So that's a little bit about where where we are from a design perspective. Uh, I doubt the two session ID is going to be our final design, uh, but it's an iterative process. So then basically we just created the blueprint child of the Lyra game instance, uh, which we call Lyra game instance plus and assigned in your project settings that Lyra game instance uh, child as the game instance for the Lyra project. This, this would have said Lyra game instance to start with. We changed it to Lyra game instance plus. On the persistent component, we basically go into our game feature plugin uh, definition. And for the Lyra player state, we add the persist player state component. That's our new component. We do not add it on the client. We only add it on the server. And so this will inject the persistent player state component onto the Lyra player state actor. Uh, as long as you're using this game feature in your logic. All right, so let's flip over and take a look at the code. All right, so basically, if you were following along, you will end up with the OWS plugin uh, plugin in your project file and access to the various OWS uh, classes through C++. If you look at the OWS login widget, um, it has a uh, HTTP module pointer. It's got the customer key, the path, the timeout, and it does a create session and these are around the creating a session. I'm not 100% sure on the external. I'll need to ask Dart about that. And then it has a register for registering new, new, uh, new players. And then basically the uh, the post request and the JSON uh, request that goes on in that. And then so similarly in our Lyra game instance plus, right? We start by making it a child off the Lyra game instance. We have a few variables that we're just using to uh, control our testing process, the new user, the temporary user. Um, same reference here. These uh, were the helper, file, helper functions from the OWS uh, game instance. Sorry, it's hard to keep all that straight. Uh, same variables from the widget, same functions from the widget, same functions from the widget. Most of this was copied over from the widget. Um, we are just, you know, logging a few things, uh, getting the reference, more logging. Uh, pulling out of the INI files, just debug for some months. Here we added our logic to say, okay, if if I'm registering, here's creating a new one, and here's attempting to connect with an existing username and password. Again, we're not building any UI at this stage. We're simply testing that can we connect through to the database um, inside the game. Uh, the encrypt and decrypt, which were in the original OWS game instance, 
those were copied over without modifying. Same with the serialize. Um, we don't think we had to make any changes here. Oh, we did have to change the, uh, the callback. So you got to change the callback class, which is here. We call the API. We get our response. We populate our client user session GUID. And this is the registration logic. So the Lyra game instance plus simply takes logic that was in the OWS login widget and the OWS game instance and moves that into the new child of the Lyra game instance. Our component, um, we basically have all the delegates that came over. 90% of this came over direct from the player controller component. Uh, in fact, let's just go to the C++. There's only a few things that we had to change. Uh, scroll through that. Initializing is fine. In the subsystems is fine. Here, um, since we're only on the client and we don't want the persistent component to spawn on any bots, um, we basically get the, uh, get the owner of this component, which will be the player state. If we are, uh, if we have our boolean on to auto start, if the player state is valid, and if the player state has an owning controller, so if it was a remote client, um, it would not have an owning controller, so it would fail on that test. So as long as those three tests pass, uh, it's safe uh, because these both came back not null. It's safe to determine is this a player uh, controller. Therefore, eliminating all bots out of the equation. If it is a player controller, then we attempt our login and create session for the server uh, with our test email and password. That would basically trigger this logic where we do the API request to the create. No different than if you were in Swagger and you were typing it in there. And then when they get a response back here, we're basically uh, just storing it in our active user session. Do it, some more logging. And then the only other things that we had to change is the references here. So this was a cast to the um, OWS character. I believe this was a cast to the player controller because the original component was on the player controller. So we had to go through and make any adjustments, any references to the player controller or any references to OWS character. Uh, we just shifted those here. We had to change the logic and how to get the player state. I believe this was originally get OWS player state. Now we're just doing a generic get player state. Um, this, this is okay. So to get the player controller, we first get the player state, which is the owner of this component. That comes back. We then get its player controller, cast that to player controller to be able to travel. Same thing here. We had to change the way this constructed. And this is okay because it's um, we're casting to our our Lyra game instance here. Not even one hundred percent sure why. Oh, I know why. It was to get access to the encryption so that we could call the encryption. So this. In the original logic in OWS would be pointing to OWS game instance. So we have to change that to our game instance. Since we replicated the uh, encryption logic, this function here, which resides in our game instance now. And basically the same thing as you go down through the rest of this. There'll be a decrypt down here somewhere that is that had to be adjusted as well. So basically, between those two components, um, we're able to basically launch.
Okay, so with it loaded up, we can go to the front end map. We're actually going to turn on our uh, our logging. So we uh, created a different, uh, just a different uh, log file. Clear that. And when we launch the game instance uh, launches, and we can at this point go to our so our game instance uh, was initialized, started. Um, we got our API path from our INI file. We got our customer key. From our INI file, the uh, persistent player state component was activated. So just did a little bit of checking, and uh, the reason the persistent player state component uh, showed up in the Lyra menu was when I was going through it, I actually added it to the uh, game feature plugin, which adds these components whenever the game feature is activate it. What I should have done is added it to the game experience, which can also add components. And so in this case, the Lyra player state, persistent player state component on the server, only you can control which game experiences get persistent access or not. So the standard Elimination might not have any persistence layer added to it. However, in our open world maps, um, we'll have the persistent uh, inventory available to us. So instead of placing it here, which we're going to delete, and you're supposed to actually uh, turn the plugin off and then back on. We're just going to do an editor restart, which will do the exact same thing. And then now saving it here. So we're going to do a quick editor restart. Okay, with our editor uh, restart, we're going to first uh, turn on our verbose logging. I'm going to switch to our front end map. Clear our log. Should be enough. When we play, you see login successful. The game instance started, got the API path, got the customer key, and then created my user session ID. Then when I, oh, let's clear it. When I play, start a new game into a experience that includes the persistent component. These do not include the persistent component. This one does. And our persistent player state component was activated uh, for us and the bots. However, we only requested server login for one of the player states, and we got back our server user session here. So each of the bots that are in the level do not have that component, whereas our character does. And so from here, it'll be a matter of basically uh, reading and writing the data from the database for any adjustments in the skills, the abilities, um, or the inventories, so that rather than handing these things from the array, uh, you'll actually receive them from the database server, and that will populate your inventory, 
And then when you log out, we'll make sure the inventory is saved to the database instance. Um, so that when I come back into the world, I'll be able to come in and go out of the world and my uh, inventory skills and abilities will all be the same. So now if I go back to the menu, the game instance was already up and running, didn't need to initiate again. And if I clear my log, go into a game mode that does not have the persistent component, such as elimination. You'll see that none of the persistent um, log messages are shown. So these actors, not only did the bots not get it, neither did the characters. So one game experience without persistent inventory, another game experience with persistent inventory and persistent at the uh, instance level for public API accesses such as uh, Marketplace. All right, and for the last part, uh, I've pulled up the uh, database. So on the other server, um, we have the database running here in a remote desktop. And you'll see that if I query the customer table, I have two customer rows, one for the Lyra game, one for the hub world. Uh, so this is having two different games sharing a common OWS database server. If I query the user table, you'll see that I have um, two against uh, the Lyra game. So the Lyra game tester, the one I created in game, and then the Lyra game master. Those are both against that customer GUID. They each get their own um, user. Now do it. And then I have the hub world master and the hub world tester, both on the hub world customer UID separate uh, there. And then finally, if I get these right, this user session here is the Lyra game customer UID, the tester user ID and then the session ID that is here. And so this actually will tell us that our two session uh, solution isn't going to work. Uh, we are going to have to find a solution to make it one user session, uh, not one for the game instance and one for the uh, persistent player state, because they'll override each other when you, uh, when you ping back and forth. So. As an example, if I hit play, jump into a world that's going to initiate its own connection to the database. I'll have this new session queued here, which is 060. If I refresh, the user session here is 060. So the problem is if I now go back to the main menu, my game instance thinks the first user session is still active, but it's been overwritten by the second session. So at this point, um, if I were to try to use the original user session ID that's stored in the game instance, we'll end up with issues connecting to the database. So uh, in the next video, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll find a solution for that. But at this point, we've been able to uh, effectively connect to our database, and that will allow us to read and write data uh, persistently from within the game. So in the next chapter, 
for the next part of this chapter, we'll resolve this issue and then uh, start the reading and writing of uh, elements to and from the database. Thanks for watching.